What is critical theory? What is its impact in the church right now? How has it become a kind of de facto worldview uh, among so many Americans? And is it a competing worldview actually to the gospel of Jesus Christ? We're gonna talk about that and much more today with our guest, Dr. Neil Shinvi, on today's Theology On Air. Well, thank you so much for joining us on today's Theology on Air. We think that every episode is important, but we think this one is especially important because we are seeing, uh, I would argue, kind of the fruit, in a way, of uh, many decades, at least many years, of, uh, of thinking on, a, on an issue that's known as critical theory and its many manifestations. We have a very special guest, Dr. Neil Shinvey, uh, who uh, is a Christian apologist and a, a chemist, as I understand it as well. Uh, he's a very bright guy, going to be joining us to kind of break this down. Uh, but before we introduce him, I do want to say uh, you're listening to us. Uh, if you're listening through KPFT, go to kpft.org. KPFT is free speech, listener-supported radio. And for now, they're supporting conversations like this, where we're taking a, a hard look um, at the really inform the conversations about it. So kpft.org is where you can go to support us uh, to learn more and listen to other stuff that KPFT has out there. Uh, I'm Evan McClanahan. I'm the pastor over at First Lutheran. I'm joined by Sarah Stone, our co-producer, who is an outreach coordinator at Memorial Drive Presbyterian Church. How are you, Sarah? I'm dandy. Good, good. Well, um, this was, I know, a show that you really wanted to do. Uh, like me, we've kind of been introduced to the the phrase critical theory, critical race theory in the last, maybe the last couple of years, but really then again, the last month or two. So it was like, we definitely need to talk about this. So I guess you should be excited about tonight, right? I am very excited about tonight. I didn't know the term critical theory, contem contemporary critical theory, any of that. I knew the term tribalism and I knew the concepts behind this, but I didn't know quite where they were from. But recently I have become a bit of an expert myself, not nearly as much as Dr. Shenvey. So I'm, I'm really excited to get this going. Yeah. Um, Dr. Shinvi, I should have this in front of me. Uh, your website, your apologetics website is what? Shenviapologetics.com. But if you Google Neil Shenvi, you can find me. I think I may be the only Neil Shenvi in the world right now. Oh. It's not a very common name. So yeah. Yeah, just Google N-E-I-L-S-H-E-N-V-I. -E you'll find me. Good deal. I was going to spell that for you. And yeah, if you Google uh, Neil Shinvey, you'll come across some, I know I read a, a, a wonderful summary article in the Gospel Coalition where you talk about this stuff. So there's lots of, uh, lots of other materials out there where people can find. You've done several podcasts already, so we're very glad that you're, you're wanting to join us. But if, if, if okay with everyone, let's just kind of maybe jump right in. Uh, we've already said the words critical theory. Uh, it would be good if we had a kind of a working uh, definition of that, I think. So Neil, how, how should we describe and understand that phrase? Well, that's a very complicated question. I'll probably say that a lot tonight, that these are very complicated issues. So how do you define critical theory? Well, let's talk about history. Karl Marx uh, invites consensus as the first true critical theorist. That's according to Dr. Bradley Levinson in his book, Beyond Critique. So his ideas go back to Karl Marx, not really his ideas about economics, but his ideas about how power works within society to produce in injustice and inequality and oppression. But the phrase critical theory goes back to 1937, an essay by a man named Max Horkheimer in his essay, Traditional and Critical Theory. He introduced that term, and he and the other members of the Frankfurt School were trying to apply Marx's theories more broadly than just economics. They wanted to look at how power works and changes society as a function of things like mass media and culture. But that was 80 years ago. So since then, so critical theory can refer narrowly to the Frankfurt School, this bunch of sociologists and philosophers working in Germany and later in the United States and Colombia. That, that would be critical theory with a capital C and a capital T. But since that time, it's grown into this huge umbrella of disciplines that would encompass things like uh, queer theory, critical race theory, critical pedagogy, post-colonialism, black feminism. These would all be termed critical theory in the broad sense, or sometimes they're called critical social theories. There's not just one of them. And so what we're seeing today in what's sometimes called cultural Marxism, I don't like that term at all, uh, intersectionality, I don't like that term either, uh, <laughs> but the social justice movement, what we're seeing in sort of the woke movement, it's a colloquial term again, those ideas are coming through this critical tradition. 
that is very broad and diverse, but what we're seeing emerging, as you said, is functioning as a worldview based on a small set of ideas that really encapsulate where these ideas are coming from. And once you understand them, it makes a lot more sense what people are saying. So I, I, again, the label you use is not important. If you want to call this cultural Marxism, I don't recommend that. You want to call it identity politics. If you want to call it critical social justice, that's D'Angelo's term, that's fine. I, I call it contemporary critical theory. But whatever label you use, I want to focus on the ideas. And once you understand them, you'll understand a lot more of our cultural moment right now. Yeah. Can we dive in and just explain? I was just going to say, you mentioned D'Angelo. That's Robin D'Angelo who wrote the book White Fragility. White Fragility, the number one bestseller on Amazon, Audible, and the editor's choice for Kindle. And it's been recommended by innumerable evangelical organizations and churches over the last two weeks. It's very popular. It's, well, I'll, yeah, I'll leave my, my thoughts about that maybe to later on. But um, so ideas like uh, white fragility, white privilege, intersectionality, those all come kind of out of this umbrella but if we're going to be talking about it with regard to race tonight, I wonder if maybe we need to just get some kind of basic definitions of that out there. Because I've heard you before talk about race being a social construct. Other people mm -hmm. want to talk about it as biological. Maybe just say a little bit about that before we keep diving in. Well, why don't we start with what critical theory is, and then okay. we'll zoom into critical race theory, which is a subset, a subdiscipline within this broad movement of critical theory. Perfect. So really quickly, critical theory is trying to understand how power operates within society. And the four central ideas of this contemporary expression of critical social theory are the social binary, oppression through ideas, lived experience, and social justice. So number one, the idea of the social binary says that society is divided into uh, oppressor groups and oppressed groups along different axes. So here's a quote from Sensoy and D'Angelo in their book, Is Everyone Really Equal? They write this, for every social group, there is an opposite group. The primary groups that we name here are race, class, gender, sexuality, ability, status, exceptionality, religion, and nationality. And they go on to say that sexism, racism, classism, and heterosexism, heterosexism are specific forms of oppression. So that's number one. So again, they're oppressor groups and oppressed groups along different axes. Uh, the second idea is oppression is not just uh, about cruelty and injustice and uh, tyranny and coercion. That's the old definition of oppression. But contemporary critical theorists understand oppression far more broadly. So here's Iris Young. She writes this. In its new usage, they've redefined the term, in its new usage, oppression designates the disadvantage and injustice some people suffer not because a tyrannical power coerces them. It's not just tyrannic, tyrannical control, uh, coercion, violence. It's not that but because of the everyday practices of a well-intentioned liberal society. Mm. So oppression is embedded in, quote, unquestioned norms, habits, and symbols. So it's hard to see, it's subtle, it's insidious, but it's how the ruling class, whether that ruling class, the oppressor class, whether it's whites or men or heterosexuals or Christians, it's how they impose their values on culture and justify their dominant status. That is a form of oppression. Can I, can I just jump in quickly yeah, and then we'll, we'll come back because just this week, I mean, it was a big kind of headline where Sean King, Sean White, yeah. I can't remember, Sean King, I think, okay. Um, yeah, so he was, he was uh, saying that, you know, all the white Jesuses have to come down, right? Like all mm -hmm. the statues, all the, well, well why? why? And, 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 and th I also wanna say too, a lot of this, People, people, when they ever think about like politics or political philosophy, they think at most conservative liberal. That's kind of as deep as they get, right? And so this is really about like what kind of shapes what many people call liberalism. I mean, there are a lot of conservatives my age, I'm 40 and older, who are going like they're totally caught unaware at like what traditional liberalism has become because they don't realize that like what's fueling it now is this you know, critical theory that, and I didn't realize it either until recently, you know, this critical theory that has been embedded into the minds of young people. And it's so deep and it's such, you know, it's so much more than just more government or more taxes. I mean, it's way more than that. It's about overhaul and destruction. So you're talking about, so well-intentioned practices like a somewhat look white looking Jesus in right. a church that now becomes oppression. How yeah, could yeah. that be? Yeah. Now the term he used was white supremacy. If mm. you understand that's another term that's been redefined. So white supremacy uh, within a, a critical race theory 
does not refer to the Ku Klux Klan or to neo-Nazis. It refers to whiteness as the standard. Mm. So white supremacy does not refer to hate groups. It now refers to whiteness as the default mode of, hum of humanity, why this is the standard by which other racial groups are judged. So that's why he would say something like this, you know, old 16th century picture of Jesus, you know, that there was, there was there in a church before people even just, you know, really discovered other continents existed. That's white supremacy because why? Because it assumes whiteness as the standard. Mm. So that's, that's, so he's using that term consistently there. You have to realize that that's influencing how he's thinking about, oh, by the way, you know, I'm a Baptist, so I have no real problem with saying, hey, that's not Jesus. <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you probably shouldn't have these statues anyway. But my point is just that he's understanding white supremacy in terms of this redefinition of that, uh, that, that phrase. Um, so, yeah, so, but you can say, yeah, you begin to see how prevalent these ideas are. They're just, they're just everywhere. They're, they're in the air we breathe in our culture. So number three would be lived experience. This idea is that uh, the, uh, the, the lived experience of oppressed groups gives them special insight or access to truth generally available for groups. So there's an asymmetry there. Uh, oppressor groups, men, whites, heterosexuals, Christians, they, are, they have both conscious and subconscious reasons to ignore the oppression in society, right? They don't want to believe that we're in an unjust society. So they tend to ignore or be blind to that, their privilege that they're experiencing. On the other hand, oppressed groups at least have the potential to attain what's called a liberatory consciousness. They can colloquially get woke to the reality of their oppression. That's not automatic because they're also socialized into the dominant class's um, ideas. So they have naturally, they're socialized into whiteness or the patriarchy or heteronormativity or cisgender normativity. They, they believe that because they're taught that by culture, but because their lived experiences don't match those claims, they can see through them. They can say, you claim that whiteness is universal and objective and you're appealing to quote unquote evidence and quote unquote reason and quote unquote objectivity, but my lived experience shows that those claims are just bids for power. You're trying to justify your own dominance, and I see through that and challenge and interrogate these so-called objective universal norms. And mm -hmm. my lived experience then needs to have a sort of authoritative status because it can make me see things that you're blind to. That's number three. And then finally, the whole reason that people are, uh, that, that critical theory exists, it's, it's whole raison d'etre, the whole, the whole purpose for its existence, is social justice, it's the fourth idea. Now, social justice is a slippery term. People use it in many different ways. But according to contemporary critical theorists, uh, social justice means the following. This is Mary McClintock. She writes, she defines social justice as the elimination of all forms of social oppression, whether it's based on, quote, gender, race, ethnicity, religion, sexual orientation, physical or mental ability, or economic class. So when, and, and where's the, what does oppression mean? Well, remember, oppression means when a dominant group imposes its values on culture. So social justice to a critical theorist means overturning and dismantling these systems and values and norms that are imposed on society by the dominant group, which justify their power. And the goal then is to tear down all of those hegemonic, they're called hegemonic norms or hegemonic narratives so that we can achieve a state of equity in which power is shared between all these different groups equally. That's their, that's their idea of essentially this utopia that where power is shared equally democratically between all these different groups. Neil, so, is it actually yeah. that it's shared equally or I feel like it seems so often like they want it to actually flip. Yes. Yeah, so, okay, that's, here's the thing. In the long term, they will say, absolutely, we, need, we want a state of equity where everyone is on the same footing in terms of groups, at least, not individuals, but groups. But they'll say in the short term to counteract the effects of our historic white supremacy, the patriarchy, sexism, racism, trans, transphobia, heteronormativity, to counteract that for the short term, we need a power inversion. That is why we center marginalized voices and decenter the voices of oppressor groups, right? So in the short term, they'd argue uh, we'd need to not just equalize power, but redistribute it to currently marginalized groups. Mm -hmm. So that makes yeah. sense? Yeah, yeah, no, it makes perfect sense. Yeah. There's so 
so, so, so many questions. Um, how, when you talk about social justice, I mean, we might be able to talk more and unpack this later, but just quickly as we're kind of getting our terms defined, what would make social justice different from regular justice? So here's a really key point I'm gonna make throughout this talk. You have to ask people to define their terms. Mm -hmm. When someone says, I believe in social justice, don't say you shouldn't or you should, right. or that's right. in the Bible or it's not in the Bible. Say, what do you mean by social justice? So, and so some people might say, they might say, I define social justice as applying biblical principles to our laws. Now, who's against that? I mean, I hope no Christian says, no, we should not apply biblical principles to our laws. And I think everyone wants it. In fact, who is straight up against a just society? Is anyone going to say, no, actually, I want social injustice. That's what yeah. I'm for. So in some ways, it's a kind of a deliberately nebulous term. However, what I would say is when you hear people describing social justice, what I would argue is that it's almost invariably not biblical justice. Why do I say that? Because biblical justice always contains some element of punishment. I'm not saying it's limited punishment. I'm not at all. This is restoration, right? Rehabilitation to some extent. Uh, so that, I, that's, that's true. And yet, Biblical justice does include things like punishing evil. When you hear people advocating for social justice, even if their causes they list are actually very good and biblical, they almost never talk about punishing the unjust. And, and so I'd argue that at the very least, their view of social justice is not the totality of biblical justice. Does that make sense? Yeah. Do you have any like examples of that? Because I mean, I think most of the Christians listening would think, well, that's what I want. And, and I want to see the bad guys be punished. So, I mean, do you have like something that somebody would be fighting for where they're not going to see injustice punished? Oh, I mean, I think just look at the, if you touch Google social justice and you'll find that social justice organizations, you won't see any mention of any kind of punishment. You'll see things like caring for the poor. You'll mm -hmm. see things like, um, you know, sitting up against racism and sexism, mm -hmm. all things that I think Christians should say, yes, absolutely, we want to get rid of racism and sexism, we want to care for the poor, but you're never going to see, like, we want, so here's a funny example. Uh, if you look at the ESV, the, the translation, and you look at their section headings, the section heading for Exodus 22, 15, I think, the section heading is laws of social justice, but the laws that are listed under laws for social justice include things like capital punishment, like how to punish certain people uh, for certain offenses with death and stoning. So the point is, uh, so clearly the ESV translators are not a bunch of liberals here. They, yeah. they clearly are using the term in a, in, a, in a biblical way, but what they include within laws of social justice would be things that I think no modern day social justice advocate would recognize as social justice. All I'm saying is that the terms could, can overlap, maybe, yeah. but they're not identical. Yeah. Can I ask too, like when you, you know, in, in the Bible, it seems like people are held accountable for what they did. Mm. Whereas on critical theory, it seems like I'm already accountable for white supremacy because that's been redefined and because I'm part of the majority. I also want to ask too, if really what we're talking about is sort of not about white and black, but about majority minority. These are the sorts of things that go on in every culture, right? I mean, so if I went to Japan, I'd be in the minority and I would expect to conform to that majority's norms. Likewise, in Africa, one tribe where everyone is black, every, you know, one tribe may be the majority. So do they have certain majority norms that the minority understands? You don't just, you know, go in and say, blah, blah. Now, I'm not saying that, you know, that justifies, say, slavery or, you know, segregation or, you know, racism or anything like that. I'm not saying that a minority group doesn't have, you know, status. In, in fact, we're a nation of, of laws, not of men, um, which gives individuals certain rights. But I'm 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 curious as to is that a difference between what we think of as social justice and biblical justice? You know that um, biblically we you know God is not a judger of persons, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah, there's a, so many good questions there. So let's start with the question of whether or not social so whether or not critical theory views people as so complicit. So they would, the, the term they would use they wouldn't talk about sin. Obviously, it's not a sort of theistic worldview or even discipline. Um, I wouldn't say it's a, it doesn't, I wouldn't say it is a worldview. It's better to say it functions as a worldview because it's answering the big questions about life. Like 
who am I? What's my purpose? What is good and evil? Where does it come from? What's my goal in life? So those questions are worldview questions and they are indeed answered by these contemporary critical theorists. Um, now, the question of, well, are you really saying that I am guilty in some sense because of my race, say? A and they would say no. Uh, Robin D'Angelo, well, okay, some of them would say no. If you look at Delgado and Stefanczyk's Critical Race Theory in in introduction, their book, they talk about how given that all white people have benefited from the system of white supremacy and they receive a white privilege, they say, when you look at it that way, no white member of society seems quite so innocent, right? So they, so they, they, they kind of, they're not straight out saying that you're guilty because you're white, but they're saying, you know, given that whites benefit from these, this white privilege, maybe they are a little bit not quite innocent. I'm like, well, what's the opposite of innocent? <laughs> it's, it's guilty. But okay, but D'Angelo, for example, will say, look, and she'll flat out say, all whites are racist. You know, we have, you know, we, you know whites have a, she'll say weak as she's a, she's white. So she'll, we, you know, I, as a white person, have a deeply racist worldview with deeply racist patterns. So she'll say all of that, and she'll, but then she'll say, and talking to her white audience, she'll say, you know, we have to admit our complicity in racism and we, but here's the thing, she'll say, now, you just it's not so into racism. You can't control that. So I'm not saying that you're a bad person. You, you don't, don't think that when I call you a racist, I'm saying you're bad. I'm not saying that. You can't control that, but you're socialized into racism. But you can control what you do now. And the way that she'll say it, so what you now have to do is act and you have to become an anti-racist in order to, now that you've been awakened to your complicity in this racist system, you're, now it begins your moral responsibility to act against it and to dismantle it. And this is what is generally known as anti-racism, not just passively being a non-racist. She would actually problematize that and say, if you're not actively fighting these racist systems, you're complicit in them. You can't just be non-racist by not participating. You have to be actively working to dismantle racism and then you're an anti-racist. And she'll go on to say it's, an, it's a lifetime struggle. She is still deeply racist. She has to constantly do the work of unlearning her racism and working against these structures. Uh, but so, so are you guilty because of your social group? You know, it's, it, people are differ, but what they will would say is you're all complicit in this injustice and you must work against it by adopting essentially their prescription for how to dismantle these systems of oppression. That was the first question. Okay, well, the second question was, oh yeah, majority versus minority. This is very important. D'Angelo and Sentoy do not talk about minority groups. They talk about minoritized groups. What's yeah. the difference? They actually say numbers aren't the relevant factor. For example, all the white men make up about 15% of the U.S. population, and yet old white men are the canonical oppressor group, right? You, you know, old white men are the worst. Whatever. Go to Twitter and just Google old white men on Twitter, and I don't do not. that. Yeah. yeah, maybe don't do that. But if you do, you'll find all these people saying old white men are the worst. Well, but aren't they a minority numerically? Well, yes, but they're not minoritized because they wield power. It's hegemonic power. They, they, they control the narrative. So the idea is that all of these norms and values that we take as natural, objective, empirical, reason-based, all of those norms and values actually uh, perpetuate old white male interest. They justify old white male power. And so because of that, old white men are a minority group, but they are not minoritized. They're actually an oppressor group. So that was the, so then you can get even further into that. So Peggy McIntosh in her seminal paper, um, Unpacking the Knapsack from 1989, I think, oh, yeah. where she, she popularized the term white privilege in that paper. It goes back a little bit farther to white skin privilege, but it's, the origins are complicated. Um, in that paper, she has a list of like 47 different manifestations of white privilege, but she conflates all these hugely different categories. So some of the things she lists are majority privilege. Right. So things that in another country would be totally different. So, and they're, they're, they're non-moral. Like if I go to India, I'm half Indian. If I go, well, okay, so let's go to somewhere else. Let's go to, let's go to, let's go to, um, let's go to Zimbabwe, right? Where, where I, I will clearly be not in the majority you know, by my skin color. Um, in Zimbabwe, 
if I cannot arrange my day to be, be to meet mainly around half Indians like me, it's not because I have pri- some weird privilege. It's because I'm just a minority. There's not some kind of terrible oppressive dominance being wielded by you know black Africans. It's just that they're majority there. It's you know so so that the, so she talks about how you know it's white privilege that you can arrange your day to be around mainly white people. And I say, well, yeah, but even in a sinless society, that would be true if you're in a minority. Uh, and there are other things, though, that are a result of sin. So she talks about, well, as a white woman, I don't have to worry about people following me around the store worrying that I'll steal something. Well, that's the result of sin. So mm-hmm. she's combining these very disparate categories and calling them all white privilege, whereas we really have to disaggregate them and say, which of these are the result of sin and which of these are just the result of being in a numerical majority or which are a combination of both? And it's, it's, it's complicated sometimes, but critical theorists tend to take a very, I don't want to say simplistic, because it actually can be quite complicated, but they take, say, a unitary approach toward explanation. So, for example, Ibrabex Kendi actually says on page 11 of his book, Stamp from the Beginning, he says, if you are an anti-racist, uh, that makes then you realize that all racial disparities in this nation and globally are solely the result of discrimination. Now think about that statement. All racial disparities are solely, he's in fact, you say part and part some other factor, he says that's assimilationist racism, okay? So only discrimination, it's the only reason for disparities. But just think about that for five seconds. The NBA players are 75% black. That is not because of pro-black discrimination. Right? It's because they're good at basketball, those players. Uh, the Ivy Leagues are disproportionately Asian and Jewish. It's not because of pro-Asian discrimination. It's just, it's just or pro-Jewish discrimination. It's not. So you, know, you think even for a, a half a minute about those examples and you realize, or the, I think uh, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I, my father's from near Goa, so he's Indian. And, and so I'll use my, my, my own half ethnic group as an example. But Indian Americans, the median household income for Indian Americans is over six figures. Now, is that because Indian Americans are being, there, there's a lot of pro-Indian racial bias in the U.S.? And the answer is no, there are lots of reasons. You know, immigrants tend to be more highly educated, more motivated. It's a selection bias. But in his, his statement is so blanket that it's just even a moment's, analysis shows it, it lacks a lot of complexity there. So anyway, that's a long tangent, hmm. but uh, well, gives you an I, example. Yeah, go ahead. I just want to clear up a couple of things for those that are watching. They're like, oh, maybe they caught us, you know, 10 minutes in or something. And they think, are they saying racism doesn't exist? We are not saying that. So maybe we can just define some of those terms quickly so that no, but people don't think like we're sort of trying to throw all of these ideas out the window because we're not. Yeah. So, maybe so we can I talk yeah, a little ahead. bit about race and actual racism. Right. So actually, if you look at some of my talks, I always spend, people ask me to talk about critical theory, but I always put in a section about modern day racism, because I think I don't want people to use this as an excuse to ignore actual racism, both mm-hmm. in our culture and in the church. So I, and I show them that you don't have to rely on lived experience to, to prove that racism exists. I mean, that's one way you can know it. If you experience racism personally, of course you know it exists. Yeah. But if you look at data, it can show you that, yes, even today in the U.S., there is plenty of racial discrimination and racism. Mm-hmm. Um, for example, and I have lots of data on my website and my talks, but so one example uh, there's a really well-known study, uh, I forget the author's name now, she, unfortunately she died recently, but she um, published a meta-analysis of uh, studies on hiring discrimination that were carefully controlled experiments mm-hmm. on uh, you know, uh, advantages, and she found that in the last, so over, the, over like 50 years of studies, on average, like two dozen studies, whites received callbacks at a rate 50% higher or 40% higher than blacks, all things being equal. So the only thing that differed was their race. And uh, that same disparity was that sort of discrimination was found that held the constant for the last 30 years. It has not changed. Hmm. That's just one example. There are really horrific surveys about the opposition to interracial marriage yeah. in the church today, in society, but also in the evangelical church. So shockingly, 
in 20, look at the, have the data right in front of me. In 2008, uh, of evangelicals, over 30% of, of self-described evangelicals said they would oppose the interracial marriage of a family member. Over 30%. And according to Bradley Wright, who's a Christian sociologist, that percentage did not change appreciably when you accounted for church-going evangelicals, not just nominal evangelicals, but actually church-going evangelicals. Now, that number has been steadily falling for the last 50 years, and so it's probably much, it's probably around 25, 20% now, because that was 12 years ago. But that said, uh, you know, no, question, is that my experience? You know, I've been in evangelical churches for, you know, 18 years now, and the evangelicals that I have personally met are completely the most gentle and kind and loving people in the world, com you know, horrified at racism, completely accepting, uh, uh, compassionate. But here's the thing, if I have to trust my lived experience or the data, I trust the data. And the data says across all these different surveys and all these different measures, there really is racism in the US today and even in the church. So we can't pretend it doesn't exist. And we, in fact, it would be a sin to deny it exists. Mm -hmm. And in fact, it would be a sin to not confront it because we, we always confront sin because it's harming, it's harming people. It's against God's will. So uh, I, I try to make a really big point in my talks that I'm not here to tell you or not. I'm here to show you that the way that we're trying to solve racism and sexism and all these different forms of injustice, we're imbibing a dangerous and false ideology that is competing with Christianity. That's, that's the point of my talk. Yeah. Really then, I mean, the, the biblical worldview and the critical theory worldview, if you could say, you know, it, they're, 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 they compete with one another. They, they can't be reconciled. I mean, that would be fair to say, right? Yeah. And for, I haven't gotten into the reasons yet, but yeah, there yeah. are a lot of just deep conflicts between the two. Again, critical theory is not a worldview, I would say that, but it yeah. functions like one. And certainly the, the manifestation we're seeing today um, and that are, that, that's being promoted by people like Robin DiAngelo. It goes well beyond just a, an analytical tool. It's way beyond that. It's touching on your deepest commitments as a human being, identity, uh, moral, morality, ethics, um, you know, w how you know truth. Mm -hmm. So those things, the way it frames those questions, answers those questions, they are incompatible with the way Christianity would answer those questions. Well, let me ask this, because I think this will get into then the, the, the ways those, those worldviews, I'm just going to say worldview, even though I agree with you, it's not a worldview, but, you know, uh, the, way, the way they're in conflict. You know, one of the things about Christianity, broadly speaking, is that it's, it's forward-looking. It's about reconciliation. It's about, a, a, you know, our eternal future, but also the better world we can build now. And I think you see evidence of this in the New Testament, the way disparate groups once at odds are together in community and fellowship. Critical theory strikes me as relitigating the past to the nth degree. I see no end in sight. I, I don't hear what, well, what we can talk about Black Lives Matter, and you, you indicated in, in our emails that maybe critical race theory is not the, the right category exactly for them. But, you know, again, amidst the good things that might be said about real evidence of racism, what concerns me is that I don't see the end in sight with this. I don't, I don't see where this leads. I don't see reconciliation. Even white people are saying, uh, you know, like Miss D'Angelo, like, like you mentioned, whose book I've not read, but it's, uh, apparently it's a lifetime pursuit of, mm -hmm. of, of knocking the racism yeah. out of you. Mm -hmm. it just try, I just don't know what the end game is. And that's what concerns me because I actually do believe in peace and actually do believe in justice and actually do believe in reconciliation. Um, and, uh, so I'll put it on mute because when I get excited like that, my guinea pigs that are my children's who are not here right now, uh, start to squeak. So go ahead. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So yeah, that it's interesting to think about how critical theory would think about reconciliation. I think generally speaking, they would not like the idea of reconciliation for, for many reasons, but here's a big one. Reconciliation within Christianity is primarily, not entirely, but primarily past tense. That when the Bible uses the word reconcile, it talks about us being reconciled to God through Christ, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. It happened past tense. It talks about how Christ broke down the dividing wall of hostility between Jew and Gentile. Mm -hmm. It talks about how we are all now one in Christ, male, female, Jew, Greek, slave, free. We are all made one in Christ. Now, obviously we don't erase our identities. We don't become genderless, 
in the same way, we don't, we don't become, we don't lack ethnicity. We don't, don't cease to be half Indian. You don't cease to be white or black. You retain those cultural identities, those, those other identities, and yet they are subsumed and they're they are, they are demoted in importance because what's primarily important now is that we are now one people that have been brought together under the cross of Jesus. Because again, we all share, all human beings share uh, the imago dei, we're all created in God's image. Two, we're all sinners. So we've all uh, rebelled against a holy God and therefore deserve wrath and punishment and hell. And we all need one savior, Jesus Christ. And so we can't look at anybody else, no matter how much their group has victimized our group. They are not totally other. They are just like me in creation, in fall, and in redemption. And so, and especially then for Christians, when we come into the church, into the body of Christ, it would be deadly for me to view another Christian as an oppressor Christian. Like, I'm an oppressed Christian. They're an oppressor Christian. That is deadly because you are basically saying Christ, you, his, the, the body that he has purchased, the people that he has purchased with his own blood are divided. Hmm. Now, obviously, you know, can you talk about reconciliation in a secondary sense? So, for example, you know, you say all Christians are reconciled past tense to God through Christ and then to each other again through Christ because we're now one body. But then wait a minute. What about take take uh, you know a historical example? Take about talk about the uh, 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 um, and, and the genocide that happened a year after the genocide. Are those two groups reconciled because of Jesus? Uh, in, in one sense, yes, right? True believing Hutus and true believing Tutsis are reconciled. And yet, do you, do you think that there's no lingering mistrust between the two groups, even among Christians within those groups? No, there is lingering mistrust. And in fact, it's reasonable, right? When you've just seen your entire family murdered right, by another ethnic group, you can see why there'd be a lot of healing to be done. Now, so, uh, so in that sense, we can talk about reconciliation in the sense that blacks and whites in this country, because of our terrible, horrific racial history, mm-hmm. there is tension there. There is a mistrust there. So we can talk about reconciling in that sense. But that reconciliation is grounded in a fundamental past tense reconciliation that happened to us already. Right? So... I don't think I wouldn't discard the term racial reconciliation, but I would say that has to be grounded in recognizing one, we have been reconciled as sinners, and we dare not. When Jesus talked about lack of forgiveness, if I have not, if I have been sinned against, and the other person repents, I forgive them and, and embrace them. Period. And if I don't, I am actually forgetting what God has done for me in Christ. Um, but then, second, even more so, if that's true. If I have, if I must forgive my brother who sins against me and repents, how much more ought I to quote unquote forgive someone who didn't do anything to me, who merely belongs to a group which did something to my group? I mean, that should go without saying that I shouldn't bear a grudge against them and demand that they repent for things they haven't even done to me. Now again, I'm not saying you should. Therefore, everything's rosy. I, there's a really good story in um, Eric Mason's book Woke Church. I love telling this story. Um, he talks about how his father, Eric Mason's father, when he was a young man, was dragged from his home by a bunch of white men for a crime he didn't commit and was beaten so badly that his, his own mother didn't recognize him, Mason's grandmother. And Mason heard that story growing up. And he says, it influenced how I thought about white people, even after I became a Christian. And he says, I got to pull up this quote. It's so good. It's going to make me cry. But he says, basically, he says, you know, it doesn't mean, you know, he says this. These, remember, he has heard his dad telling him a true story mm-hmm. about how he was beaten beyond recognition by white people. He said, Mason says this, these and other experiences colored how I was raised to deal with whites, whether Christian or not, just as my father's expectation, experiences impacted my perceptions about race, so my perceptions will mark those of my three sons. This is how it works. Oh. One generation, it's a really moving quote. Yeah. One generation's pain and fears are passed on to the next. It doesn't mean that we must repeat the sins of racism and bigotry of the past, but it does mean they impact us in some way. Mm. Now, so is, are you going to go to him and say, you're just a race baiter? Oh, you can't get over it. No, man, this was his own father, okay? If I had him in my church, I would say, brother, 
I weep with you. That is so messed up. And I don't know how I'd handle it if I heard that story growing up. But let me tell you, I oppose that. And I'm here to show you that Christians do not relate to one another in that way, or they shouldn't. And that you will be treated as a, as a member of a body of Christ here. You will be treated as a brother or sister here. And how can I rebuild that? I know it wasn't my fault. I didn't do that. Mm-hmm. You know, I wasn't even born. But how can I rebuild that trust? Right? How can I show you that this is not the way Christ would have us relate to one another as brothers in Christ? So yeah. I'm just saying, I, I'm just saying, so, but if you uh, contrast that, contrast that approach, a Christian approach, to how Robin D'Angelo talks about approaching interracial friendship. In her book, White Fragility, which is literally on the book list of numerous churches right now. I know. In, in that book, she says, emphatically, every interracial friendship is tainted by racism. It cannot be escaped, every single one. In a paper about whiteness, about dismantling whiteness in nursing, she says this, the question is not, did racism take place, but rather, in what way did racism manifest in this situation? Now think about what it would mean if a black person internalized her claims. If they said every interracial friendship is tainted by racism, my white friends, it's not about whether they are being racist, but how they are being racist. In every interaction, they are trying to reinforce their white dominance over me. They from a recipe of racial unity it is a recipe for destroying the church and mm-hmm. that's why i get so i'm like have you read this book and you can look at look at institutions that have adopted this book and it put it into practice it is tearing them apart mm-hmm. look up the knitting community the knitting community i kid you not there's a chronicle of what happened to the knitting community when it adopted this sort of social justice ideology and how it just uh, just was torn apart by these recriminations and accusations of racism and cancel culture. And it, people, it was terrifying. And it's happening over and over. Look at Evergreen State, where Robin D'Angelo gave a speech about racism before the campus erupted in these just complete chaos and mm-hmm. exiled Brett Weinstein and his wife, Heather Hying. So um, again, that's, I could go on about other books, but that that one i'm just like what you know what are you doing church yeah what are you doing which by the way you you cried on our podcast and that's that's against the rules of white fragility you know that but you're that's a man i am not a white I'm woman though cry. what yeah so she's a whole section if you haven't read the book guys she's a whole section on um white women's tears and how white women crying is actually a way for them to reestablish racial equilibrium and assert their white dominance yeah. So even crying in, in reaction to racism is problematized as an expression of racism. But fortunately, Sarah, I am half Indian. So there you go. Oh, and I'm well, also male. I will, I will say this. I love what you had to say about, and Vodi Bakum has given several talks recently on the same idea that what happened on the cross, re- reconciliation in all forms has already occurred. And it's this great equalizer because we're all equally in need and all equally, um, it, it's available to us. But I want to take a question because it seems like a good time for it from one of our Facebook viewers. Yep. She says she would love to hear, and I'm sorry, I have a cat attacking me right now. So this is real life. Okay. Um, she said she would love to hear how you would respond to the claim that there is a quote, collective consciousness on the side of black people. It's the trauma of their history. On the side of white people, it's oppression. This term seems to be used to apply complicity to whites and give permission for the easily offended of the black slash people of color group. So can you talk a little bit to this idea of collective consciousness? Yeah, you know, it's so funny because when you really get into the literature, critical race theorists often disagree with each other emphatically. So for example, Ibram X. Kendi, he's not a critical race theorist per se, and he actually sort of takes some unique views of his own. Um, but, But he's very popular. So his book is like number two on Amazon right now. His book, How to Be an Anti-Racist. His book, uh, Stamped from the Beginning, is number five, I think, right now. Um, but he would, he, you know, he's, he's very uh, much on the anti-racist end of the spectrum. You know, he's, when you write a book that's a number two bestseller entitled How to Be an Anti-Racist, you're an anti-racist. But he would completely repudiate that idea of this collective black trauma. He would mm-hmm. call that a racist idea Oh, wow. Now, why? 
because he would say that when you say that, you are saying there's something wrong with black people. Even if it wasn't their fault, but he, and his, 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 it's not my claim. I'm just saying his claim would be that by talking about how blacks are collectively traumatized by the past, that you are saying something's wrong with them. Now, I, I don't know why he says that, but he does say that. Um, and similarly, uh, D'Angelo says that a positive white identity is an impossibility because whites, by definition, are oppressive. And to be white is to be oppressive. And so she strives to become less white in her own terms, right? which means less oppressive. In contrast, Beverly Tatum says that whites should try to achieve a positive white identity. Okay, So all I'm saying here is that when people tell you, well, this is the right way to think about race according to quote unquote scholars, you're like, guys, the scholars don't even agree. So let's, instead of thinking about what the scholars tell us is the right way to think about race, why not think about the Bible and what the Bible tells us to think about race? And now here I would just put a little plug in. Critical race theory is not totally wrong about everything. They're, they're just not. They have some uh, true insights that we should, as Christians should appreciate. And one of the main ones is this. Race is a social construct. Now, as we understand it today, um, there are a biological, what's called biological populations. So obviously you, you can trace your DNA back to like, you know, Africa or India or Europe. Even there are, you can do that. And you couldn't do that if there was no such thing as ancestral populations. There all are. And but as an idea, a way to classify humans into different kinds is something that we have socially constructed. And here's a simple example. And there, there are many ways to see this, but the average black person in the U.S. has 80% African DNA and 20% European DNA because of various, you know, actually, frankly, probably a lot of rape, rape going on by slave owners. Uh, so that's unfortunately a terrible reality. But the fact is, the average black person in the U.S., I think it's, it's something like 80% African and 20% European. And the, let's say they take a white person as 100% European DNA. If a black man marries a white woman and they have kids, their kids will often be raced as black, like Barack Obama, right, was our first black president, because even though he was biracial, like me, but he looks black. Right? We just, oh, he put him in the black category. But here's the thing. When a black American and a white American get married and have kids that are biracial and get often get raced as black, <clears throat> that quote unquote black child has a majority European ancestry. Interesting. <laughs> yeah. Perfect illustration. Actually, I got some, there were legitimate, you know, white supremacists who were very angry at me for making that point. And so, I, but I made that point to them. They wanted to say race is a real biological category. And I said, well, no, it's, it's not because you can show that there are all these borderline cases where we get it wrong. Mm -hmm. Another simple example too is think about, uh, we talk about, we lump all these categories together with, oh, they're white. Take, take a progressive hipster from, you know, Portland, Oregon, and compare them to, like, some guy living in Siberia. Oh, they're both white, are they? Really? What does that tell you? Does it tell you anything about their ethnicity, their culture, their nothing? It tells you nothing. So these huge buckets we have, or, you know, Asians, and it's so hilarious. Asian? Really? So you're saying like Pakistanis and Indians and Koreans and Chinese people, and we're all Asian, right? Cool. You know, <laughs> it's, it's so clearly a socially, and then, you, and then you look at critical race theory, one of their main, again, sub-disciplines is called whiteness studies. And there are lots of problems with it. But one of the things they do is, that's accurate, is they look at how historically the idea of a whiteness has evolved. And you can actually trace court cases where they tried to nail down who was white and who was not white. And there's a terrible, tragic, almost farcical history of these court cases. But the point is just this. Race is a social construct and not a biblical one. And so the Bible talks about ethnicity as a biblical category. And, and again, it's not a primary category. Uh, uh, the primary category for identity should be in Christ. Like being a Christian is our number one a unifying factor, but ethnicity is a thing, and, and even, oh gosh, this is a rabbit trail, but if you look at how Paul, Paul was proud of being Jewish. Paul talks about being Jewish a lot, and talks about how it brought comfort to him to find other Jewish believers. So 
his ethnicity, and it's a little complicated because Judaism was a religion and ethnicity, but his point is, he doesn't have a problem with saying, yeah, I'm, I'm a Jew and I'm proud of that, right? I, I'm, I, it's, they're my people. He talks about my people. That language is not foreign to the Bible. What's foreign to the Bible is making that category take precedence or even come remotely close to our Christian identity, which Paul says in Philippians 2, should be counted as rubbish, as hmm. the actual Greek word there, I'm sure Evan can tell us, is not really polite. <laughs> it's cool. Oh. Right, back me up here. I'm not a Greek scholar, but it's 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 a it's a slightly um, off color word. But yeah, it's potty, it's potty it's talk. Potato, yeah, potty talk. So the yeah. point is just that you know, whenever you exalt your ethnic group, whatever it is, to a status that rivals or even come close to your Christian identity, then that is idolatry and has to be put to death. And that's what's so important and that's what's that's why i'm sort of so frustrated in this era is because of course i always think you know christianity has all the answers but on this issue i think it has the answers too like to actual peace and to actual reconciliation among people because we really have this history in this you know way of 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 uh, in a discipline i think even right because l let's just say that i agreed that like people are sort of in you know, inveterate racists, you know, to a degree. We, we grow up with biases towards people who look like us and against people who don't. Let's just say that that's the case. It might be a factor of biology, you know, uh, or, or survival or microevolution uh, in instincts or something. Um, but the... Or we, we are told and taught to look past differences. And that strikes me as incredibly useful in, in, um, at, at any time, but especially now. Um, and, uh, and, and we believe in things like justice, which also strikes me as useful. And, and that's where um, critical theory and, and kind of focusing so much on race that you actually don't end up looking at the person and assessing them on their own values, their own rights or their own wrongs. And that's why it strikes me as an really an unbiblical kind of, um, you know, well, I mean, it's obviously unbiblical. They don't purport to be biblical, but um, that's what strikes me so harmful about it. I, I, I don't see how it, it, it helps. It might explain some of our dynamics, but if our dynamics aren't right, the question is how do we get them right? And yeah. it strikes me that in Christianity, we have tools for that and disciplines for that. We only have about four minutes or so, and we, we haven't talked about Black Lives Matter, which I- oh, Wait, I can think, I pause you for a second, Evan? Yeah. Just mm -hmm. for the sake of the radio show, I would love to, for the last little bit, I would love to hear Dr. Shinby talk about what is the gospel and where does critical race theory sort of go away from that? Because I think that's kind of what we said we were gonna talk about tonight, and then we can talk about a lot of stuff after our 58 minutes ends, but can yeah. we do that? Yeah, let me just quickly say, uh, and I'll, I'll be brief here, but my big concern is not with critical race theory per se or critical theory, but the entire idea of social justice. Um, mm. I'm not saying it's a bad thing. Obviously, it's, it's hard to define. But one thing that all people that advocate for social justice agree on is that if, it, if it's a good thing, then it's something God commands. So even Christians who would advocate for social justice, they would say, God commands us to do social justice. It's an imperative. It's an obligation we have as Christians. And I'd say, okay, let's, let's assume that's true. Let's grant that premise that social justice is an imperative. So great. Here's the question. Is the gospel an imperative? Is the gospel something that we have to do? Is the gospel a, a moral obligation that we have to perform? And the answer is no. Absolutely not. The gospel is an indicative statement about what Jesus has done mm -hmm. for bad people. It is not a list of things that you have to do to fulfill your moral duties. It is a list of what God has done to rescue wicked, unjust people like you by sending his just son to take your place, to die for your sin, to rise from the dead, and to restore all things, things that you could not do. And so when I hear people saying things like social justice is part of the gospel, they are mingling God's law, which is good, but will break you in half. Mm -hmm. the good news of the gospel which will rescue you and we mm. cannot mingle the you know the the do this and live imperatives of god's law with the glorious it is finished 
of the gospel. Hmm. That is why I worry that this language is confusing at best. At, at worst, it is going to become another gospel because it's telling you, you can be justified if you do certain things hard enough, if you love people enough, if you work for to overturn racism enough, if you stand up for the oppressed enough, mm. that is how you know you are on the right side of history, that you are good, you're seeking a verdict, and God says that is not the way because the verdict is guilty, mm -hmm. and you need a declaration not guilty on the basis of what Jesus did for you. So that's really why I'm passionate about this issue, that we not forget in, in, our, in our zeal for justice, which is maybe admirable, that we not confuse it as a, a, another way to attain a right standing, which can only be given to us by God through faith in Jesus. Mm, so yeah. that was a brief thing. About, if we have time left, I'm happy to take so the BLM thing, Black Lives Matter. Do we have time well, for that? Evan, do you want to close us out first for, for one second? Yeah, let me, let me just say, uh, if you're listening to this on the podcast and you want to gather Neil's thoughts on Black Lives Matter and where this, that kind of fits in with all this and what the Christian's response to that should be, you're going to have to either find us on Facebook. We are on Facebook Live as I speak, but uh, it'll be on our Theology on Tap Houston feed. There you can find that. I think we'll take this, put it on YouTube as well, and put some awesome title to it like Neil Shinvi Destroys Critical no, Theory. And, uh, <laughs> And get people to uh, to listen. Um, anyway, but yeah. So um, so if you want to hear about that conversation, you're gonna have to find us on Facebook or YouTube, Theology on Tap Houston. Just put that in, and we'll we'll come up. Um, and uh, and uh, yeah, but I think I'll go ahead and close this out because we do try to end. You know, we we try to have each podcast right at 58 minutes. So I want to thank you for listening. If you're listening on as this is aired on KPFT, look, this is not what you're gonna hear on KPFT. Quite the contrary, you're gonna hear uh, the opposite of everything like this on KPFT. So we try to bring you. Uh, true free you know, at the on every Thursday at five o'clock out on the KPFT airwaves. And if you like what you heard, or if you didn't like what you heard, well, get in touch with Sarah or I. You can uh, just find us uh, Theology on Tap Houston uh, Facebook. Theology on Air is our radio uh, portion of that ministry. Uh, you can find me at First Lutheran FLHouston.org and Sarah's at MDPC.org. That is org, right? Yeah. Okay, but uh, we're going to end the, the radio show and podcast now. So until next time, we want you to question freely, think deeply, and disagree as needed. However, Neil, uh, tell, us, tell us what we are to do with Black Lives Matter. Wow, they have gotten really popular in the last couple of weeks. Uh, I noticed I went into Barnaby's, which is a cafe here in Houston, and this was like a day after the protests or something. I, I mean, within, within a few days of George Floyd's death, and it was all over the place, you know, Black Lives Matter. Yeah. And obviously this is something that, I mean, breakneck speed, you know, all the social medias, all the major corporations from, you know, McDonald's to Nike. I mean, I, well, actually, I, I couldn't verify that. But it seems like they're all, you know, hey, you know. And I'm going, well, you know, as a Christian, we had two shows on racism already. So I think I've already said this. But we, we all agree with the sentiment, of course, that, you know, black human beings are of great importance. Uh, but the organization Black Lives Matter is something else altogether. Where does that fit in with critical theory? Are they part of that matrix? What's their background and what should we think of it? So, yeah, the, I think thinking about this question, uh, you know, I haven't studied Black Lives Matter very much at all. Um, you, when you hear what they talk about, uh, you certainly hear hints of, you know, things about oppression and justice and power and overturning these unjust systems, which sound a lot like critical theory and critical race theory. Uh, the, but what I would say is this is all very complicated because if you look at the history of critical social theories, they include things like black feminism, people like Audre Lorde, or Bell Hooks, um, black liberation movement in the 60s and 70s. And so those are all, those would all be included in critical social theories. And so then the question is, well, where did Black Lives Matter get these ideas? Was it from critical race theorists like Crenshaw and I'm not maybe D'Angelo, uh, Derek Bell, or did they get these ideas from bell hooks? Um, uh, so, I mean, going way back, you go back to other uh, black activists. So it's not clear where they got these ideas. What I will say though, is that the organization was founded by three uh, black women who I think, I think two of them are lesbians, I'm not sure. Two of them And if you look, yeah, and they were, I'm not sure how many of them, so I get, forgive me if I get it wrong, but, um, if you look at the way that they have, un they understand 
the connections between racism and sexism and, and homophobia and queerness and et cetera, that is very much a theme of critical race theory today. Mm -hmm. So well, I wouldn't say, I don't know where they're getting these ideas, but they're very present. So let me just read it to you actually one of their statements from their website. Um, okay, so let me go back a little bit. The idea of intersectionality, the term was coined by Kimberly Crenshaw, who is a critical race theorist in 1989, I believe, in her, in her essay, Mapping the Margins. That term was coined then. But the idea that our, our identities interact in complicated ways, that you're not just black or just a woman, you're a black woman, and therefore will experience a unique form of oppression. That was Crenshaw's idea. That idea goes back way farther. So if you look at um, the Combahee Collective River Statement in 1970, they coined the phrase interlocking systems of oppression to talk about how, say, black women experience both racism and sexism in ways that interlock. So you can't separate out just sexism or just racism. So that was sort of nascent intersectionality. Or um, I think there's a black feminist who coined the phrase double jeopardy mm. to describe, again, racism plus sexism acting together to put black women at double jeopardy. So these ideas go back before Crenshaw even though intersectionality is largely attributed to her. And <laughs> oh man, is it really funny? That doesn't matter. <laughs> Critical theory humor. There's a, there's a big uh, question over whether it's problematic to attribute intersectionality to Crenshaw alone. It's in Patricia Hill Collins' book, Intersectionality as Critical Social Theory. She goes through a whole chapter of where did it really come from? Is it just Crenshaw alone as some kind of genius or does it have longer roots? And anyway, don't, don't worry about it. But let me just read to you a statement from an interview with one of the founders of Black Lives Matter, which I think is very, shows you how she completely has absorbed this idea of interlocking systems of oppression. So she says, oh, one second. Um, she says uh, in an interview, I'm sorry. Um, this is actually her quote. Intersectionality should always be at the center of our movements. This is Patrice Con Colors. Who mm -hmm. is how to pronounce her name? Patrice Colors, uh, yeah. Good. Intersectionality should always be at the center of our movements. We're not just talking about every category that someone lives under. We're talking about the intersections in which people are oppressed. Being black, being queer, being trans, being a woman. The places where we see people are the margins. Again, he's, I, don't, again I don't know if she's quoting Crenshaw here, but Crenshaw introduced the term intersectionality from an essay called Mapping the Margins. Mm -hmm. That's what we mean when we talk about intersectionality, and it's so important and critical that we have the folks at the margins, because when we center people at the margins, we get everybody mm -hmm. free. So uh, that's just one example of how Black Lives Matter has, has uh, recognizes, or at least believes, that all of these various oppressions are what's called mutually constructing and must be mutually dismantled. So let me quote the last quote here from Ibram X. Kendi in his book, How to Be an Anti-Racist. He writes things like this. Uh, to, be, to truly be anti-racist is to be feminist. To truly be feminist is to be anti-racist. We cannot be anti-racist if we are homophobic or transphobic. To be queer anti-racist is to understand the privileges of my cisgender, my masculinity, of my heterosexuality, of their intersections. So that's just another example of how, you know, today we're seeing a lot of convergence between ra you know, critical race theory, queer theory, uh, intersectional feminism. They're all converging to uh, sort of not a single voice, but they clearly have absorbed the same ideas. You're, you're not going to find very many anti-racists today who would not also say yes and also sexism and homophobia and transphobia are also forms of oppression that's sort of built into the fabric of what they believe. Yeah, I have a sort of a follow-up question and, and maybe a fear that I, I feel like I'm speaking for more people than myself when I say, I mean, two of the founders of Black Lives Matter are self, uh, they call themselves Marxists. Marxists, mm -hmm. they're trained in Marxist strategies or whatever. And then of course the movement for Black Lives, which intersects with Black Lives Matter, if you go to both of those websites and you read what they want to have happen, or you listen to interviews with some of the leaders of the protests from Black Lives Matter, there is this idea about systems are the problem, right? And the systems of oppression need to be dismantled. But of course, it's not just the police, of course, it's uh, the justice system, it's the prison system, it's on and on it goes, and they have to be completely torn down before they're rebuilt. And I don't know how that happens without anarchy in the middle. 
I don't know what their answer with that to that would be. I don't know where critical race theory or Marxism weighs in on that. So okay, that's the thing. So if you understand critical race theory, one of the um, one of the reasons for the creation of critical race theory was that um, it, it one of the, its main themes is a critique of classical liberalism and what's called a rights discourse. And if you understand critical theory, you understand what they're saying. They would claim that what liberals do when they appeal to civil rights, and even the civil rights movement, they would say, the problem there is that uh, it's reformist. They're trying to fix the system and make it better. And their argument is that actually legitimizes a fundamentally corrupt oppressive system. So critical race theory would, would see problems with even the civil rights movement because they would say, it's like, um, it's like, let me try to find a, a better analogy here, but it's like trying to repair, it's polishing brass in the Titanic, right? If you're on the Titanic, you need to get off the ship. Yeah. You don't need to fix the ship. In fact, in fact, fixing the ship is actually legitimizing the the, uh, the ship's captain who's saying, everything's fine with it. Look, we're fixing it, right? So what you want to do is say, no, we refuse to compromise. We want nothing less than complete. They wouldn't say revolution per necessarily. They might say uh, transformation, um, uh, dismantling, overturning. Mm -hmm. uh, occasionally, they'd say revolution. But they want to replace the system with something else entirely. And, and again, and that, that's not, that is an outgrowth of critical race theory and the various ways in which they critique things like um, what they call the perpetrator perspective in law, uh, the idea of colorblind or neutral justice. They would problematize that and say, look, you, you, that's, that's a way that the ruling class actually justifies all the suppressions by saying, well, we have the rule of law in this country. They would question that. They'd say, yeah, you say that, but really you're just trying to justify your system yeah now, now one of the critiques from liberals in the legal profession was look they're like your project is completely negative and destructive it mm -hmm. doesn't propose any solutions you keep saying the system is broken but you don't offer anything in its place mm -hmm. so that was and that's a critique made by secular liberal yeah. legal scholars so i think you're picking up on a very important question um, with these, well, I always tell Christians to do, especially like in churches, they say, well, what do you, what do we, how do we, how do we really work for justice then? Because I think what, what BLM does give you is this, just do this, just dismantle, the, defund the police, abolish the police, whatever you want to call it. Um, do this thing. And we, pro you know, we promise you it'll get better. Uh, and, but the things they actually recommend are often incredibly vague or, or, all right. So, and it's, it's, so what I always tell Christians is focus on policies. Mm -hmm. Say, what do you want to do specifically? Mm -hmm. And then ask the question, and what would be the actual effects and side effects of doing that, right? Mm -hmm. So I think that critical theorists as a whole tend to make these really vague recommendations. Um, I mean, Kendi himself does in many places in his book. And then to not even bother analyzing whether that's going to be practical, whether it's going to be actually help anyone. <laughs> yeah. There's a, there's a place in his book where he says, he talks about how every law, every policy is either racist or anti-racist. Everyone. There's no middle ground, right? And, when he, when he, and he, he takes this, he, he even says in an interview, even proposing to reduce the capital gains tax is racist. You're like, wait, what? The capital gains tax? What does that have to do with racism? And it, and it gives you reasons why, but it literally- More, every, more white people own stock, stocks exactly, and- Exactly yeah, right, right, yeah. But, so the, and so <laughs> anything that would, that would increase or perpetuate disparities is racist. Anything that would decrease them is anti-racist. But then that, that, when, you, when you think that he believes that, right? But again, even the, the least bit of probing carefully was like that's ridiculous because you're like okay let's abolish private property completely if no one owns anything racial disparities vanish because there's no private property anymore so would that be a racist an anti-racist policy and in contrast would it be a racist policy to protect private property rights i mean according to his definition 
The answer is just yes. <laughs> There's no room for, well, that's a bad idea. It's either racist or it's anti-racist. And, and he's very clear that we should be anti-racist. So what I would say for Christians is that we have to be more nuanced and careful if what? If you really want to help people. If all you care about is, you know, is ticking the anti-racist box, then yeah, do whatever he says. But if you actually think, wait a minute, wait a minute, abolishing private property would probably hurt a lot of people, right? Or, or another one. Uh, it would hurt the poor the most. Well, arguably. and here's the thing. Uh, and Evan, we don't want to, I mean, this is going to get me in trouble, but and maybe it should I think we're already there, Neil. Okay, well, okay. The people that are, people, if you add, if you do, so there's a survey that came out from Monmouth a few weeks ago in the aftermath of George Floyd's horrific death. And they asked people, you know, things about police. Uh, do you think, do you, do you approve or strongly approve or not approve or disapprove of the police, local police in your area? They found that when you look at blacks and whites, uh, do they express strong approval, some approval, nothing, or disapproval of police? Blacks and whites both expressed around 71 or 70 percent expressed either some approval or approval. Both. Now, blacks were more likely to only some approve and not strongly approve, but the overall approval was the same. Mm. And what's interesting is, although blacks had been harassed, would, would report being harassed more by police in their lifetimes, they would also be much more likely, about 50%, I think, more likely to report being saved from harm by police. Mm. 50, I think it was 50% more likely than whites. So now, now wait a minute. So, so on the one hand, you say, okay, we have a problem with police brutality. Okay, fine. I, I'm, t I'm happy to admit that, right? To say, yes, we need to do something, if we can, to get rid of police brutality, to have better oversight systems in place, maybe fix the unions. I don't know. I'm not a policy guy. Fine. But when you say, if we just abolish the police, and then I'm not sure how you cash that out, well, do you realize that police are black to be police too, and that actually these high crime areas will often suffer from lack of policing. Mm -hmm. And, and, and oh, so it's, and it's complicated, but the bottom line is you have to be at least willing to ask those questions. If you are just dogmatic and say, I don't care to even ask those questions is racist. Look, do you want to help people or not? Here's a one final example is very concrete. A few years ago, um, a bunch of activists wanted to help convicted felons get jobs. So currently, a lot of states allow employers to have, when they have an application for their job, they have a box that says, have you ever been convicted of a felony? And you have to check the box, yes or no. And obviously, if you check the box and say, yes, I've been convicted of a felony, your, your employer is often going to say, well, forget that. I'm not going to hire an ex-felon, okay? And so activists said, look, we want to give ex-felons a, a second chance, which is great. And what's more, because uh, Blacks are disproportionately uh, incarcerated as opposed to whites. Therefore, this discrimination against ex-felons actually disproportionately hurts blacks. So we're going to pass a law that is a, that are ban the box laws. We're going to get rid of these laws. They were going to say, you cannot ask whether someone has been an ex-felon. Mm -hmm. And when we do that, we'll end up helping blacks because they're disproportionately yeah. ex-felons. Okay. Okay. So they, the, their intentions were good and, and, Good. They were really trying to help people, and especially they're trying to help blacks and help. And, and that's great intentions. The actual result was there was an increase in racial discrimination in hiring. An increase. The law, when the law was passed, it ended up hurting the very people that these activists were trying to help. Why? Because employers said, "Well, I really don't want to hire a felon, right? Maybe let's say they ran a daycare, and then when you run a daycare." Maybe you really, really, really don't want to risk hiring someone who might, by chance, harm the kids. So it's understandable. When they were not allowed to ask, are you an ex-felon? When they were forbidden from asking, they said, well, I know that blacks are disproportionately ex-felons, so I'm just going to discriminate against blacks to try to avoid ex-felons. Now, we can say, well, they shouldn't have done that. Okay, I, I understand. But all I'm saying is the actual real-life consequence harmed the people that were trying to be helped. Yeah. Okay? And, and I'll, I'm not saying, by the way, even in the absence of those laws, there was still racial discrimination. So it was still there. I'm not saying it was, it was, it was created it, 
but I'm saying it exacerbated it. And I'm not excusing the employers. I'm just saying we have to be practical about trying, actually, do we want to see things that sound good in theory or things that actually help people in practice? Yeah. And we cannot rule out discussion a priori because it's, it's racist. I want to actually help people. And yeah. we have to be willing to, to ask challenging questions about our policies in order to really help people that need help. I want to, I want to, well, honor your time, first of all, and not just keep you, you know, in perpetuity, but oh, um, I'm fine. Well, if we were to round out our conversation tonight, and there's so many more questions we could ask, but I think one thing I want to know, um, and maybe this can be our last question, unless it spurs some exciting rabbit trail, where as Christians, can we be sort of like on the watch for the negative aspects of critical theory creeping in to whether it's social media, things we read on the news, conversations we have, um, st stuff we talk about at church, where can we watch for that? How, what sort of like, are there key words to look for? Are we listening to a certain mindset? And then what do we do to have a more biblical approach in those moments? So if someone comes to me and starts talking about white privilege, I'm not gonna be like, well, that comes from critical race theory and that's stupid. I mean, hmm. wh where are we looking for and how do we combat it lovingly? Because what you did when you talked about the gospel is you just, you made this turn, which was just so essential but in sort of everyday conversation, how does that happen? Does that make sense? Yeah, so yeah, like you said, don't jump on certain phrases or jargon. I, I do tell Christians, don't use this jargon if you don't really understand what it means or where it comes from. People will throw around these words like white fragility because it sounds hip, but I'd say, or even white privilege. Mm -hmm. And you have to understand, go back and read the paper or the, read the book where that term originated because it's often saying things that you would be horrified to mm -hmm. say or maybe i don't know but so don't drop the jargon but when you hear that jargon don't leap to conclusions don't start calling them a marxist just say hey what do you mean by that term uh same thing with social justice say well, what do you mean by social justice what i would look for all with is it number that characterizes critical contemporary critical theory uh is an asymmetry and asymmetry, so there's a double standard between say, how we view certain people, how we view certain groups, the standards of evidence required, uh, the, like, certain people's lived experience would be valorized, other people's would be ignored. So for example, you know, uh, if a woman says, well, I have this lived experience of being, of experiencing sexism because I'm a woman, people would say, oh yeah, absolutely, it's terrible, sexism is a terrible thing. But if a man says, well, you know, actually, I have a lived experience of being discriminated against as a man, they'd say, well, be quiet. Wait, 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 wait. why is my lived experience? And the answer is, well, they, would, they might not know why. But the ideological root of that idea goes back to this idea of the lived experience of oppressor groups is actually conditioned by blindness. They are blinded by their privilege, whereas the experience of oppressed groups, they are more in touch with reality because of their oppression. Mm -hmm. So people wouldn't be able to articulate that, but you kind of you 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 would realize that yeah, a, a rich white male speaking about as, about his lived experience is not going to be taken seriously, mm -hmm. and, you know, and even if you don't know why, well, it's, the why is because of this as an underlying foundational uh, ideology. Yeah. So when you see that asymmetry, that's a one big thing, and the other big thing I would say is again a, an appeal to lived experience as sort of central to how we know truth. Yes. And especially when uh, appeals to evidence or, uh, you know, analysis or to science or to data or to surveys or anything objective, even to scripture, is sort of frowned upon. Hmm. When you see that dynamic, in other words, well, someone's, when someone makes a claim and you say, well, that doesn't sound quite right. Let's look at, let's step back and look at, say, the data. Let's look at the uh, well, let's look at another person. Here's another person from the same demographic group who disagrees with them. Or let's look at what scripture says. Mm -hmm. when, when, you were, when you said, hey, hey, guys, you need to be more empathetic. You need to stop being so obsessed with truth and objective truth and just sort of be more compassionate. Now, by the way, I'm not against empathy and compassion. I am it's absolutely not. not. Yeah. In the moment, in the short term, when people are hurting, just empathize. Don't be like Job's friends. Just weep <laughs> with them. Be upset with them. That's lament with them. That's totally fine. But in the long term, in the long term, 
we must insist that our thinking and our behavior and our theology is driven not by empathy, but by truth. Hmm. Truth found in scripture and truth found in reality and God's revelation through general, through nature. Mm -hmm. So again, don't go out there and start being a jerk. Don't say, Neil said I could be a huge jerk and just, you know, the second someone cries, I just hit them with, you know, a book of, uh, you know, a, a, a study on how, why crying is bad. Don't do that. But in the long term, when yeah. you think about how we know truth, you do not know truth through your lived experience or mine. And let me just say one last thing. My, my collaborator, Dr. Patrick Sawyer, who has a PhD in communication and cultural studies, is very well read in this subject matter, you know, has a relevant PhD. His research is on uh, looking at white nationalist groups, neo-Nazi groups today in this country, and how they recruit new members. Mm -hmm. And what he found in his studies is that one of the ways that they recruit is by appealing to the lived experiences of young disaffected white males. They will go to these, you know, people who feel marginalized. They feel like their people despise them because of their race and gender. Like the whole incel group? Yeah, sure. And they'll go to them and they'll say, hey, do you ever feel like people despise you for being white and male? Is that your lived experience? Mm -hmm. Well, let me tell you, I have a worldview that explains that feeling. In fact, it affirms your lived experience. It tell, they'll tell you, oh, give, you know, give me a break. You're a white, ma privileged white male. You have no idea, but I will listen to you. I will affirm your lived experience. I will affirm your feelings and tell you how there's this huge conspiracy against you. People are trying to to deprive you of your birthright as a white male. Now, here's the thing. Their lived experiences have led them astray. Yeah. Their lived experiences have, 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 have been the means by which they, they embraced a terrible lie about truth that's completely antithetical to the gospel. Mm -hmm. So that, that just shows you why we cannot trust our lived experiences to necessarily give us insight into the truth because we are, you know, our experiences have to be interpreted. Yeah, they don't give us immediate access to these universal truths about God or about reality, and that's why. And if if you're like, if you're gonna say, oh, I see why that it can be twisted, it can be corrupted. We always have to come back to again to scripture and to God's revelation in nature, and again enter our community and test our interpretations against what they have to say. Yeah. Um, so, that would just be my big caution. Um, again, short-term empathy is fine, but empathy cannot govern our long-term views about truth. Yeah, no, that's great. I think the word necessarily is probably the most important word in that sentence. Like your lived experience can be true, but it's not necessarily true. It doesn't align with reality necessarily. Anyway, Evan, anything else before we kind of close out? No, so many thoughts, but we definitely want to honor Dr. Shinvi's time. I just, I just want to say one thing that, that I've observed watching, say, the news last month, which is that we're talking about things that are somewhat high level. We're talking about books that a lot of people maybe haven't read, but it is amazing to me how, how these ideas sort of get filtered down, right? Like they get, like they go from the ivory towers, you know, they end up, you know, and through, through certain books, through whatever, 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 they just, it just kind of becomes part of our language. And, and like you said, like there's something very intuitive about um, what people are thinking and feeling. I even thought, as we were talking about, did this all begin with politically correct language 30 years ago? Right. Remember when you couldn't call him the mailman anymore because it could be a woman. So it's the male person, et cetera, et cetera. And it was almost like conditioning for, you know, ch changing your speech. And then slowly like this became an offense and that became an offense and this became an offense. I don't know. Just random thoughts. But it is amazing how, um, I mean, I think about too the, the people tearing down statues, and why is that? Why does that? Why is that bothering people? Even if we don't really think the people who are being torn down were necessarily like great people. I mean, they might have been a Confederate, you know, slave owner or something like that. But what's the problem? It's like I think it, it, what bothers us is that we're not sure they know why they're tearing it down. And second of all, I have no idea what replaces. Like, who who are we going to put back on that pedestal? So. Anyway, it was it was very helpful conversation. I, I hope people listen. I want to just thank you for your time. Yeah, my pleasure, guys. Thanks for having me. Awesome. Okay, Facebook, we're going dark here. And uh, all right, thanks. Bye, y'all. Bye.